Thank you for waiting. We'll begin the Climate Change Disaster Reduction Forum now. My name is Amo, and I'm the Master of Ceremonies for this forum. Due to the spread of COVID-19, we are holding this event online. We'd like to express our deepest gratitude to all the participants who are participating in today's forum. Today's forum is organized by Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research, Asian Disaster Reduction Center, JICA Kansai, and the Graduate School of Disaster Resilience and Governance, University of Hyogo, with the support of Hyogo Prefecture Government and Hyogo Environmental Advancement Association. First, on behalf of the organizers, Mr. Yoichi Toyama, Director of the APN Secretariat, will give opening remarks. Hello, everyone. I'm Toyama, Director of APN Secretariat. I'm pleased to be able to extend a few words of greeting on behalf of the organizers, including APN, Asian Disaster Reduction Center, JICA Kansai, Graduate School of Disaster Resilience and Governance, University of Hyogo, at this Climate Change Disaster Reduction Forum. Due to the rapid spread of the Omicron COVID-19 variant, this event is held online. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for taking an interest in the topic of climate change and disaster reduction. In recent years, we experienced 2018 Japan floods and Typhoon Hagibis, and floods, landslides, and weather disasters beyond our expectation have been frequently occurring all over Japan. And climate change can be now called climate crisis. The government considers it's necessary to have drastic disaster risk reduction measures based on the risks of climate change. That's why in June 2020, the Cabinet Office and Ministry of Environment announced a joint message on the synergy between climate action and disaster risk reduction and showed their commitment to effectively promoting coordinated measures. To minimize the impact of climate change, Hyogo Prefecture has also promoted mitigation and adaptation for climate change. As this year marks 27th anniversary of the Great Hanshin Awaji earthquake, based on various disaster experiences and SDGs, we need to think about more disaster resilient recovery process. And that's what we need to do going forward. This forum's theme is climate change and disaster reduction and the symbolic project of the recovery from the Great Hanshin earthquake produced Hat Kobe. Hat Kobe is where APN, HAT Kobe is where APN, ADRC, JICA Kansai and Graduate School of Disaster Resilience and Governance, University of Hyogo are located. All of them decided to organize this event by organically utilizing their resources. This forum is also a part of the collaboration project Hyogo Activity between APN and the Environment Bureau of Hyogo Prefecture Government. And it's also supported by Hyogo Prefecture Government and Hyogo Environmental Advancement Association. This forum, Climate Change Disaster Reduction, Thinking about sustainable recovery in the context of SDGs has two parts. For the first part, subtopic is urban development in consideration of sustainable recovery. While for the second part, local communities is the second subtopic. And we have lecturers from broad background and they will be giving presentations on broad topics. Today's participants are joining us online from Hyogo, other prefectures, and from other countries in the world. 
I'd like to conclude my opening remarks by thanking everyone who supported us and wishing that this forum will be a meaningful one for every participant. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see on page three of the program, today's forum is structured with two parts. And please refer to page four to six for the profile of the lecturers and the summary, page seven and onward. And if you have any questions, please save them until the end for the QA session. Please make sure you put the name of the lecturer when you are asking the question. Now, we would like to start the part one lecture, Urban Development in Consideration of Sustainable Recovery. First, we'd like to invite Mr. Genichi Otsukada, Director, Climate Change Adaptation Office, Ministry of Environment, Government of Japan, to talk about climate change adaptation efforts by the Ministry of the Environment, Japan. Hello, everyone. I'm Genichi Otsukada, Director, Climate Change Adaptation Office, the Ministry of the Environment of Japan. Thank you very much for inviting me to the symposium, Climate Change and Disaster Reduction. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about our efforts on climate change adaptation at MOE. If you look at my profile, you will notice that I was living in Kobe until last June. I was working for the APN Center, one of the co-hosts of today's event. I wanted to visit Kobe for the first time in a while and join the other speakers in person, but Due to the current situation, I have to participate remotely, unfortunately. But I hope my talk will help you when you think about the synergy between climate action and disaster risk reduction. Now, let me share my screen. I'd like to begin. This slide shows the current global warming situation. The top left shows the changes in global average annual temperature, increasing at a rate of 0 0.72 degrees Celsius per century since 1891, or by 1.1 before 2020. The top right chart is CO2 concentration, which is about 47% higher than the pre-industrial area. The lower left chart is about anthropogenic CO2 emissions, which has increased dramatically since industrialization. This slide is about the Paris Agreement. It was adopted at COP21 in 2015. Under the agreement, all the UN member states are obliged to set greenhouse gas reduction targets. The parties have agreed to limit global average temperature rise to well below 2, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. Also, it aims at achieving the carbon neutrality goal by mid-century. The IPCC Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius says, in order to avoid exceeding 1.5 rise, we need to achieve the zero CO2 emission net zero in around 2050. At the bottom are CO2 emissions and the comparison. Currently, developing countries account for 60% of emissions, which means that not only developed countries, but also all the member states have to set reduction targets and take action. International trend for sustainable society. On top of the Paris Agreement, three major agendas were set in 2015. 
The first one is the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which sets four priorities actions and seven global targets. The second is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which adopted the SDGs, which is nowadays commonly used in the society. And the third one is the Paris Agreement. Those three global ag agendas require us to take actions for achieving the goals. Especially, it is important for us to take a comprehensive approach to achieve all the goals set under those agendas. This slide shows extreme weather events around the world. Shrinking sea ice extent, heavy rainfall, and flooding events or heat waves and tropical cyclones, those extreme weather events occurred around the world in 2019 and 2020. This is about weather events in Japan. For the past few years and almost every year, heavy rainfalls and big typhoons occurred, causing devastating damage. For example, the 2080 Typhoon Chebi caused devastating damage, which I believe you remember vividly. The July 2020 heavy rains occurred with record-breaking rainfalls at many locations from western to eastern Japan. There is a concern that if climate change progresses further, extreme weather risks will increase. This is about scientific knowledge provided by IPCC. IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has published reports several times in the past based on the most updated scientific knowledge. The most recent report is the sixth assessment report by Working Group 1, published in last August for the physical science basis. In February this year, Working Group 2, working on adaptation, will start their meeting tomorrow, February 14th, and schedule to publish their report at the end of the month. Mitigation report will be issued in March, and the comprehensive assessment report combining the three working groups' input in September. The slide is about the report published by working group one last August. As written here at the top, it has been determined for the first time that human activities is the cause of global warming. Also, as shown at the bottom, the frequency and intensity of extreme high temperatures and heavy rainfalls are projected to increase along with the progress of global warming. By limiting global warming to 1.5 instead of 2 degrees Celsius, frequency and intensity of those extreme events could be reduced. So far, I have used the words mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation is measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change. Adaptation is measures to avoid or reduce damage from climate change impact that have already occurred or are expected to occur in the future. We need to work on mitigation and adaptation simultaneously because they are so closely connected and inseparable. Today, I'd like to focus on adaptation in my talk. Act on Climate Change Adaptation was enacted in 2018 in Japan. There are four points. First, the Act clarifies the roles to be played by the government, municipalities, business operators, and citizens. Also, the national government makes the Climate Change Adaptation Plan and update it based on the result of climate change impact assessment conducted every five years. Second, the information platform to accumulate the latest scientific knowledge is served by NIES, the National Institute for Environmental Studies. Third, enhancing local climate change adaptation. Since the impact of climate change varies from place to place, it's important to promote adaptation factoring in local background. So prefectures and municipalities make a local plan for climate change adaptation and set up a local climate change adaptation center, which is a non-binding obligation. Also, the regional councils are set for each block. 
Number four is international actions. The act stipulates those things. This slide shows some specific examples in four areas. In agriculture and rice growing, high humidity resistant varieties are being developed. The lower left, natural disaster and coastal disaster, flood control plans are being revised by reflecting climate impact. Similarly, a flood control by river basin through a comprehensive action which include tangible and intangible measures by all the stakeholders is promoted. And another example is heat stroke prevention and infectious disease control for the health. These are the examples of adaptation measures. In order to integrate climate change into all relevant measures, we reflect climate change impact into adaptation measures every five years. Climate change impact assessment is conducted every five years to update the national adaptation measures based on the scientific knowledge. The adaptation measures are executed based on plan with follow-up every year. At the same time, we work on a next climate impact assessment. We have put in place a process of five-year cycle. This is about our most recent impact assessment report published in 2020. The scientific knowledge is becoming very substantial. One example of the impact reported is a decrease in yield and quality of rice. For natural disaster, the frequency of heavy rainfalls increased, which increased chances of landslide event. Based on the assessment report, we revised the National Government Climate Change Adaptation Plan in October last year. The goals and roles by stakeholders are written at the top. There are seven strategies, including mainstreaming adaptation into all government policies, promoting the climate change adaptation based on scientific findings, promoting adaptation considering local background. Progress is tracked through the PDC cycle. There are 66 KPIs set for sectorial and basic measures. Also, we set the metrics to encourage climate change adaptation at the national, municipal, and citizen levels. At the lower left, there are examples of adaptation measures. In the middle, for natural disaster, the river basin flood control, which I mentioned earlier, and the soil erosion control dams are included as adaptation measures. The lower right is fundamental measures, including enhancing scientific knowledge, implementing information collection and provision, execution of measures by municipalities and activities by business operators, international activities and cooperation. They are all included in the plan. This is about information platform at NIES. Climate Change Adaptation Center was established in 2018 at NIES. The center has established a plat climate change adaptation platform for central management of latest knowledge to provide citizens and business operators with information. The center also collaborates with municipalities and their local adaptation centers and provide technical advice. This is about the promotion of adaptation activities with the climate change adaptation centers. The Ministry of the Environment supports adaptation centers. For example, workshops are held for citizen groups and schools to collect local information through them. And also, we get information from the national government and the local public organizations. 
we run scientific analysis and put together the information and give it to citizens, and schools, municipalities, and also the NIES. This is a type of activities expected for the local climate adaptation centers. I'd like to talk about regional adaptation plan and the formulation progress. As shown here, most prefectures have formulated their plans. Those four prefectures told us that they will finish by the end of this fiscal year. Talking about Hyogo, the prefectural government and Kobe City and Amagasaki City have completed. Thank you. This is about regional climate change adaptation center and the placement progress. In Hyogo, the Hyogo Environment Advancement Center is the local adaptation center. Thank you very much for your cooperation. I'd like to talk about the efforts made by regional councils. A project supported by our budget is ongoing for formulating a regional action plan. The nation is divided into seven blocks. From FY 2020 to 2022, action plans were developed by each block with two to three themes dealt by their subcommittees. This is the list of themes the subcommittees are working on. The top right shows the themes for Kansai region, heat stress measures by the Summer Heat Measure, uh, Measures Committee, adaptation for tea cultivation by tea committee, adaptation for heavy rainfalls by the Torrential Rain Measures Committee. Those committees are doing studies to make the adaptation action plan for the Kansai block. This slide is about efforts and roles expected for private sectors and citizens. Private companies are expected to do proper management to deal with increasing climate risks or take it as a good opportunity and expand their business based on adaptation. Citizens are expected to take adaptation actions and cooperate for adaptation measures. This is about international cooperation for adaptation. AP Platt, the Asia Pacific platform, has been established for collecting and centralizing information for Asia Pacific region. The Ministry of the Environment is promoting bilateral cooperation with many countries and upload the information gathered onto the AP Platt. Also, Providing assistance through an international network is being promoted. From this slide, I'd like to switch a theme. I'd like to talk about the synergy between climate action and disaster risk reduction, which is the theme of today's event. In recent years, we saw an increase in the severe disasters, as I mentioned earlier against such backdrop a phrase, climate crisis is often talked about recently. It can be said we have entered an era of climate crisis. The Ministry of the Environment and the Disaster Management Bureau of the Cabinet Office have been discussing drastic measures for risk reduction. As a result, in June 2020, the ministers made an announcement of the joint message on strategy for enhancing the synergy between climate action and disaster risk reduction. The point is indicated in red text. Incorporate and mainstream climate action and DRR in the policy making process. The table at the bottom shows three actions. 
first, promoting comprehensive measures for a decarbonized and highly disaster resilient society. All stakeholders must act, must act on climate change and DRR in an integrated manner using various approaches. Also, adaptive recovery is included by implementing resilient measures, including the control of land use. We must promote adaptation to climate change, also changing awareness and behavior and facilitating preparedness among citizens, business, and communities. International cooperation is also included in this strategy. Regarding the concept of the synergy between climate action and the disaster risk reduction, I'd like to use this slide for examples. The left-hand side is about a community with a distributed energy installation. The 2019 Typhoon Faxai caused devastating damage, especially in Kanto region, and power outage occurred in extensive areas. A Michino Eki store in Chiba Prefecture was equipped with photovoltaic panels, solar thermal power generator, and a gas coal generator as a part of the distributed energy project. So. It kept supplying power even to neighboring residential areas in spite of the extensive blackout in the region. The distributed energy system is beneficial for CO2 emission reduction, but also it secures energy supply when a disaster hits so it can deal with mitigation and adaptation. The right-hand side is about ecosystem-based DRR in the Kushiro marshland. The marshland can retain water. So when it rains heavily, it can reduce the peak flow of the rivers dramatically. Utilizing the ecosystem for DRR will become more important in the future. This is the last slide. I'd like to summarize my talk. Due to current climate situations, the awareness of climate crisis is growing throughout the world. For the implementation of the Paris Agreement, we must work on both mitigation and adaptation because they are inseparably con connected. The Act on Climate Change Adaptation was enacted in 2018 because the impact of climate change varies from place to place. It's imperative to take adaptation actions in accordance with local characteristics. Drastic DRR measures reflecting climate change risks are needed. So MOE and the Cabinet Office laid out the strategy two years ago. Lastly, all stakeholders must try to achieve the goals under the Paris Agreement, the Center Framework, and the SDGs simultaneously and take actions for climate change and disaster risk reduction in an integrated manner. I would like to finish my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Next lecture is by Ms. Kotoko Oenishi, Director of the Global Warming Solutions Division, Environmental Management Bureau, Hyogo Prefecture Government. Topic is climate change adaptation measures in Hyogo Prefecture. I'm from Hyogo Prefecture Government's Environmental Management Bureau. Today, I'd like to talk about the climate change adaptation measures in Hyogo Prefecture. So let me talk about the climate change adaptation measures in Hyogo. First of all, what's going on in Hyogo and the future projection in regard to climate change in Hyogo? After that, I will talk about mitigation and adaptation measures. First of all, temperature change in Hyogo. Temperature in Hyogo is incre increasing. This shows the Kobe's temperature. For 100 years, about 1 to 2 degrees Celsius increase is recorded. 
Next, precipitation in Hyogo. Annual rainfall in Kobe hasn't really changed significantly. In the meantime, over 50 millimeters rainfall per hour has been occurring more frequently, as you can see from these graphs. Moving on, cherry blossoms are blooming earlier than usual, as you may have noticed. In Kobe, blooming usually occurred around April when the entrance ceremony is held. However, nowadays, cherry blossoms are blooming in graduation ceremony season. And the Japan Meteorological Agency's projection for climate change in Japan is shown on this slide. In the business as usual scenario, the average temperature in Japan is expected to increase by about 4.5 degrees Celsius compared with that at the end of the 20th century. In Hyogo as well, if we go with the business as usual scenario, then we are expecting the temperature to rise by about 4 degrees Celsius. And regarding the frequency of over 50 millimeters rainfall per hour is expected to increase by more than twofold. In the meantime, what about days without no rain? And it's expected to increase by about 10 days. So the rainfall phenomenon is expected to be more extreme. Based on this climate change or climate crisis, if we may call that, we need to reduce the CO2 emission, thereby doing a mitigation regarding the climate change. That's what we need to do. However, even with the mitigation measures, there are still some changes. And for them, we need to take adaptation measures. In Hyogo, we formulated Hyogo Prefecture Global Warming Countermeasures Promotion Plan, which include mitigation and adaptation countermeasures. And this is what we are doing in this plan in Hyogo. Our goal is carbon neutrality by 2050. And as for the reduction target in 2030, it's 35 to 38 percent reduction compared to 2013 level. And as for the renewable energy target, it's 8 billion kilowatt hours in 2030 as for the output from renewable energy. This plan has been revised in March 2021, which sets stronger target for CO2 emission and renewable energy introduction. And in April, the government also announced the reduction target, and they're reviewing the target as well. Um, more focus on CO2 reduction is the world trend as well. So we are going to review this plan within this fiscal year as well. For the reduction target, we are going to set 48% reduction goal, which exceeds the government's, Japanese government's goal. That's what we are planning to do for the revision of this plan. Let me now talk about the adaptation measures. As I said before, Hyogo is implementing and promoting mitigation and adaptation measures. As for the adaptation, we are trying to utilize the diversity of Hyogo. Hyogo has five regions. There are cities, agricultural land, and diverse land. These exist in Hyogo. 
utilizing what's unique about this region, we are implementing adaptation measures with stakeholders from all over Hyogo. They share information and tackle adaptation measures together. Policy three is to organize the information structure. We set up Hyogo Climate Change Adaptation Center to utilize it for adaptation measures. As for the adaptation measures, these are what we are doing in Hyogo. Hyogo have many uniqueness in each region. Climate change impacts agriculture, forestry, and all the kinds of industries in Hyogo. The decrease of quality of rice has been observed, and the delay in the timing of cultural literacy with seeds or spores have been occurring as well. And there's more risk of heat stroke occurring in recent days as well. Let me show you some examples. As for agriculture and livestock industries, we are trying to promote heat-resistant varieties and more appropriate cultivation method as well. And, and we, we also have Yamada Nishiki, which is a brewer's rice. And we set up a system to determine the best harvest time for Yamada Nishiki. As for natural disasters, we also have adaptation measures and afforestation is a crucial measure we do in terms of these measures. We had some overflowing and we had casualties as well. And there have been significant damage in our prefecture as well due to natural disaster. And after the implementation after the implementation of the adaptation measure, there has not been significant damage from natural disaster observed. And we also have a mutual help system. It's a mutual aid system as well. And we also have these adaptation measures. And as for the disaster weight processing, Hyogo Prefecture coordinates and, and there are some agreement made with between Hyogo Prefecture and municipalities in Hyogo as well. In this measure, information sharing, sharing is crucial. And in order to help with the information sharing, we have set up Hyogo Prefecture Promotion Center for Climate Change Action. In April 1st, Hyogo Environmental Advancement Association and Hyogo Prefecture Promotion and Hyogo Prefecture Government set up Hyogo Prefecture Promotion Center for Climate Change Action. They, this center provides many kinds of assistance so that uh, citizens in Hyogo and business operators can cope with climate change. They communicate many information and also they conduct some forums and seminars. And at the center, they collect and analyze information and they cooperate with other stakeholders to proceed with their what they do. And these are the examples of seminars and forums that the center has conducted. This seminar was for business operators and they shared information on climate change risks and showed some case studies. And in November, we, they also did the forum and talked about the mitigation measures and, count and adaptation measures, and they also invited some experts to do presentations on these topics. And also talked, they also talked about and shared information regarding how they can shift to more climate-friendly lifestyle. And these seminars and forums can be accessed on our website, on this website too. 
As for this center's projects, one of it is the monitoring study of heat island effect near the settled inland sea. 27 elementary schools participate in the continuous temperature monitoring. There hasn't been many gap in temperature between these two regions, but in Hanshin South region, it has higher temperature, so the regional gap has been observed through this study. From this page, this page, we are showing some examples from the workshops we did from 2017 to 2019. In Setsuharima region, the harvest of nori seaweed has decreased and the quality has decreased as well. And they see more heat resistant rice as well and the harvest of sand lands has been increasing and so on. These are the feedbacks from the citizens. In Tajima region, some reported the increase in the more yield of Spanish mackerel. And in Tamba region, it was reported that the black edamame crops have been decreasing. In Awaji, some reported that Akashi Kaikyo Bridge has more occurrence of traffic closed due to heavy rain. These are what citizens are feeling in terms of climate change impacts, and this information is collected. And in Hyogo, these information is linked to the further measures in mitigation and adaptation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to invite Professor Tomohiro Tabata, Associate Professor, Graduate School of Human Development and Environment, Kobe University, to talk about disaster resilient cities from the perspective of SDGs. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm Tabata from Kobe University. And uh, today, I would like to talk about disaster resilient cities from the perspective of SDGs. So this is uh, the agenda. First, about climate change adaptation and natural disasters. As uh, Mr. Tsukada from MOE and also Ms. Wenisi from Hyogo Prefecture talked about the adaptation, I would like to focus on natural disasters in my talk. And the second point is SDGs and disaster resilient communities and the relationship between them. So how well we are able to make communities disaster resilient, we need to factor in the aspect of SDGs. Number three, my research focus on the disaster related waste. So I'd like to share some insight from my study, especially the best practices for enhancing resilience in the community. And number four is summary. So first, about the climate change adaptation and natural disasters, IPCC is reporting the focus on the temperature rise. As you can see on this slide, I got this as chart from the report, and it was uh, reported in August last year, that is the sixth assessment report by Working Group 1. And it is between 1950 to 2015, and well, actually until 2001, well, the temperature rose by one degree C due to human activities. 
And when we look into 2100, we see different results based on different scenarios. It can be about 1.4 or it can be about 4.4. And about this temperature increase, it can cause a lot of impact. So the frequency and the intensity of heavy rains may increase. And this chart is from the report of IPCC and heavy precipitation of our land every 10 year event is actually increasing from this increase of temperature and the chances is different between 1.3 times and 2.7 times. And the Paris Agreement aims at controlling the temperature rise below 2 degrees Celsius. But even if it is kept at 2 degrees C, the chances of frequency will increase by 1.7 times and 1.5, 1.5 times. So actually, 2 degrees C target is not sufficient enough. And currently, people understand 1.5 degrees C is better target for us to pursue. And also, rainfall will increase by 10% times if, even if we control it below 1.5. So we need to work on mitigation in order to reduce the temperature rise, but we have to promote adaptation to climate change. And this chart is about the heavy rains, but there are uh, potential of uh, heat waves and extremely high temperatures and drought. Such weather event will occur, and it can cause heat strokes among citizens as well. And this is about Japan. Comparing to many years ago, rainfalls increase. I understand that this is a common sense that people have in Japan. And this is the heavy rains caused by weather front in 2021. It was uh, prepared by the uh, Japan uh, JMA, and it is the 24-hour rainfall distribution with peak precipitation 24 hours from August 11th midnight. And uh, the bold line in black shows locations where rainfall records were renewed in Chubu region and western part of Japan. Rainfall records were re renewed, as you can see from this chart. There are so many locations. And also, every year, when the rainy season start or end, and also summer, we have a lot of typhoons. And we had these disasters in Shizuoka Prefecture and other parts due to heavy rains. And this is the heavy rain event occurred in Saga Prefecture last year. Like every year, it, we see disasters hitting many different places of Japan. And actually, it's not limited only to Japan. Such extreme weather events are observed around the world. And this is the 2021 major extreme weather event reported by JMA. So you can see the examples of heavy rains, floods, wetter, climate, high temperatures, and heat waves. Those extreme weather events were recorded around the world. We cannot say that everything is caused by climate change or the global warming. However, there is a significant impact from climate change and global warming. And also, extreme weather can result in weather disasters, and that has been observed around the world. And this is one example 
Last year, in December, Super Typhoon Rai hit the Philippines and killed more than 300 people. This is another example. This is about the world, so about uh, weather disasters in 2021, and the top 10 worst weather disasters caused over 19 trillion yen in damage. In terms of dollars, it is 170 billion yen, uh, dollars or so. So, Extreme weather and weather disasters are occurring around the world, and the severity is forecasted to increase in the future. And this is about the climate change and mitigation and adaptation. So we need to control GHG emission and reduce them. It is a mitigation, but adaptation is also important to be prepared for it. So there are different measures for mitigation and adaptation. And today's topic is about disaster management and disaster risk deduction. So I'd like to focus on the flood control and risk management among them. Sorry about uh, using this uh, borrowed uh, word from the English sustainable recovery or resilient, uh, very important for us to factor in when we design mitigation adaptation measures. And SDGs and disaster resilient communities, I'd like to talk about it now. As you may know very well, Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, it is often used recently. There are 17 goals by 2030, all the UN member states will achieve the goal without leaving anyone behind. So all the UN members have committed to achieve that without leaving anyone behind. And of course, the national government and the municipalities have their own action plans in order to achieve SDG goals, and they are taking various measures. But on top of that, Municipalities need to achieve their own SDG goals. They have to develop and promote measures from that perspective. This is about SDGs localization. There are 17 goals and 169 targets under SDGs. And sometimes you may find it's not familiar among those targets, but you need to familiarize yourself with the target and localize the target in your own backdrop so that you are able to increase the engagement of citizens and make them understand the importance of SDGs and include SDGs into local measures so that you are able to better execute them. So local municipalities are working on various activities for the global uh, warming and also the disaster risk deduction and welfare matters as well. And SDC's goals can be utilized in conjunction with those activities. So you need to actually utilize SDCs reflected in your measures. And more important point here is, for example, renewable energy. If you are working on it, you may think you have already working on the SDGs. That is one or two of 17 goals of SDGs, and you 
think it's okay for you to be satisfied with that, but it's not really good. It's not the true concept of the SDGs. The true principle is that if you have a goal to achieve for the disaster risk reduction, you take actions and make efforts. And by doing so, you will be able to cause ripple effect to other fields of the matters, such as the uh, poverty and education. From that perspective, one example is renewable energy, though. You shouldn't be limited only to one specific goal, for example, renewable energy or energy-associated goal. You need to embrace every possible approach to cause a ripple effect to other matters associated with all the SDG goals. And this is a little bit uh, digress from the topic of today's event, though. If you are living in Kobe City, you must be familiar with Mount Loko. And when you think about forest management, what kind of SDGs are very suitable or matching with your forest management? I did this research many years ago. So forest management can be associated with the temperature rise control, biodiversities. You can come up with them quite easily, but when you deep dive, forest management can preserve water resource. Also, right to access to Rocco, mountain Rocco is another uh, example to associate it with the SDGs. So you can actually expand and embrace many different SDGs for forest management. So when we put this example in the backdrop of disaster risk reduction, this is my personal opinion, though. Actually, you can embrace all the goals. That is my conclusion. For example, before a disaster hit or after a disaster hit, you need to factor in the climate change impact in disaster management and the risk reduction plan. And before a disaster hit, you can work on the communities where people have a strong uh, relationship or the good uh, communication, or after the disaster hit, you can work on the securing a stable water and energy supply and maintaining hygiene and the public order or fast recovery and reconstructions. So when you develop a plan or measures for the disaster reduction, you can embrace all the SDGs and also international cooperation and also uh, without differentiating nation, region, people, that is uh, inclusive approach, can be also reflected on those SDGs. So when you work on developing disaster risk deduction and disaster management, you need to collaborate with uh, citizens. And by taking that activities, you will be able to embrace all those SDCs and achieve them. So there are 17 SDCs mentioned here. They are high levels, but it is, they are also associated with tangible and intangible matters. So there are something you can do for tangible initiatives or intangible initiatives. So you need to think from both ways. And the third topic is about disaster waste and the best practices for increasing resilience. So this is about disaster waste. As you can see on those pictures, Natural disaster, for example, earthquake, typhoon, heavy rains, they occur. And once they occur, 
houses, buildings are damaged. And damaged housing building become debris, and they are called disaster waste. Or household good like TV set, furniture, tables, we use a lot of different things at home for our daily lives. When they are damaged, they become the uh, disaster waste. This is the picture of refrigerators, and the lower right is a TV set. I think it is from Hiroshima Prefecture when they had a heavy rain. In the case of earthquake and in the case of heavy rain, you get different types of disaster waste generated because mud, water, damaged TV sets or the waste. Especially in Japan, tatami mats, when they are inundated, it is very difficult for even for, for adults to carry out them or remove them. And actually, I'm doing research on disaster waste generation. How much volume would be generated? And we estimate it by having the estimate, we are able to think about how we are able to reduce the projected volume. That is also important part of resilience. This is uh, from Kanto region when flooding occur and when the flood water damage household goods like TVs and refrigerator or furniture. And this is uh, telling where people are living. You may not be able to see, but river is running, running through this. And uh, these are the condensed residential areas. When the river flood, houses are inundated and housing goods become disaster waste. That is the mechanism. So in this example, so 230 ton of disaster waste is estimated to be generated. This is the case study in Kawasaki City. It is about 0.5 or 50% of annual garbage or waste generated by Kawasaki City. So the municipality have to make extra effort to treat and process and dispose such disaster waste when this additional volume is generated. So this disaster waste estimate is very important for disaster risk reduction. So we have this estimate. And based on that estimate, how we are able to reduce the potential volume of disaster waste. And we look into that as well. This is uh, uh, the approach from tangible measures, and this is for Mie Prefecture. This is for the earthquake event, and you can see the two chart. Left-hand side is when the levees remain intact. So this earthquake assumes Nankai 12 mega earthquake and the tsunami occurs after that earthquake and the levy remains intact. It may be damaged, but it can maintain its function without breaking down. And on the other hand, uh, right hand side is when the levies break down It may be difficult to see, but the volume of disaster waste generation is about 7 million ton. When the levy remain intact 
and on the right hand side, the volume could be 18 million tons if the levees break down. So the volume of disaster waste could be totally different, and installing new levees dikes would be costly. But by taking good care of them, you can prevent the huge generation of disaster waste. Also, at the same time, you can protect people and assets. So this is another example when levees remain intact and the levees break down, how much cost a difference would be between those two examples. So the volume of generation is dramatically low with the levies remaining intact, so you can reduce the cost of processing and disposal. So once the dikes are sound and standing, you can forecast less cost for the treatment after a disaster hit. Also, there is something that residents can do. So this is about household goods possessed by household. And this is targeting household living in detached houses. Or So when uh, these uh, goods are kept on the first floor or the second floor, how much difference could be generated? So the right-hand side, you can see these, uh, you know, the green bars showing the uh, goods kept at first floor, beauty goods, kitchen utensils and housewares, and housing equipment. It may be natural, but those things are kept on the first floor of housing. So when heavy rains start and it's inundated, the houses, your first floor may be damaged, but the second floor may be saved. So by moving things from first floor to the second floor up, when the heavy rains start, you can reduce the chances of huge generation of disaster waste. I know it's difficult to move the refrigerator or the washing machine up to the second floor. But this is another measure taken by citizens. And this is another example. Well, this is for Kobe City, but it is true the aging society is ongoing across the nation. Comparing to young household, elderly household is relatively large and they have more staff at home. So when a disaster hit, naturally the volume of disaster waste increase, especially with elderly housing. So based on such input, we thought it may be important for people to get rid of something that they don't use on daily basis before a disaster occurs. This is a survey we did in Kansai region targeting the elderly households. So these elderly households have something that they don't use for daily basis, and they have about 20% of the goods they possess, they are actually not used. And we asked why you don't dispose them. They say, well, it's difficult to dispose them of, or some answers were, there is no reasons. We just don't get rid of them, no reasons, and it is troublesome. So when a disaster hits, their goods are damaged and become disaster waste. 
and it can cause opportunistic dumping of waste, and it's very troublesome for municipalities. So we need to get rid of something that can become opportunistic dumping of waste. And you may think it is difficult to execute, but we have done this project. This is the project initiated by the Ministry of the Environment Kansai Office. I'm running out of time, sorry, so uh, let me skip this part. So this is a drill to take care of disaster waste. So when a disaster hit, you need to move out or remove disaster waste smoothly. So citizens participated in the drill. Uh, placed out those uh, things that they kept at their home, actually, it causes some cost for the municipalities. So it may be not easy uh, what drills for municipalities execute, but it is, I understand, a very important part of resilience. So this is the summary. So as a part of climate change adaptation, making your communities more resilient to disaster is needed. In terms of 17 SDGs, it's important to work on both tangible and intangible aspects. And let me skip. And also installing and repairing embankments or the levees, tangible part, educating citizens on the importance of increasing earthquake resistance that is intangible part, uh, very important. So educating and increasing the resilience of community people is very important, especially in the society where the aging is progressing, like Japan, it's very important, I think. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Next lecture is by Professor Michiko Bamba from Graduate School of Disaster Resilience in Governance University of Hyogo. The topic is resilient land use and housing. Hello, everyone. I'm Michiko Bamba from Graduate School of Disaster Resilience in Governance University of Hyogo. So today's forum's topic is climate change and disaster reduction. So the generally, the topic has been covered by the previous speakers, and I will be talking about how individuals can tackle these issues. And one of the way that we can tackle is how we live in terms of housing. So that would be my focus of my presentation. So that will fall under the category of adaptation measures for climate change. And there are many adaptation measures. And I will be talking about the city planning perspective. As I said earlier, how we can live in our housings in terms of the impacts from the climate change. So in recent years, there have been typhoons and heavy rains almost every year we are experiencing a disaster and damages. And we are doing a research on flood damage. And we have taken many countermeasures against these damages. In Japan, we have a flood control measures and that have been producing good outcomes. But despite that, there is a more risk of flood due to the climate change impacts. So climate change impacts may be exceeding our countermeasures. So with the national resilience plans, we are promoting the more rigorous countermeasures. 
but these countermeasures may not be enough to prevent these damages from disasters. For instance, in 2018, there was a torrential rain, and there was a significant damage in Mabi town in Krashiki. And the Class A river system had a backwater effect with the depth of 500 meters inundation occurred and also houses were swept away too. Structurally, it brought significant damages and there were inundation as well as collapse of some houses and they had catastrophic damages in the region. Other than that, there were many flood damages as well. From these photos, you can see the foundation is the only part that is left. And some cleaning has already been done in this picture, but with flood damage, inundation occurs, and also there is a structural damage due to the flood, which causes recovery to be more difficult. So we had these significant damages, as you can see from the picture. So we are targeting 2023 to complete the preparation for tangible aspects of things. But does that mean that we ha will have zero risks if we have tangible aspects of things ready in place? But that the answer is no. So there's a limitation for what we can do in terms of flood controls. That is increased risk of flood damage due to climate change. So there is a limitation on what we can do in flood control, focusing only on improving tangible facilities. Therefore, we need a comprehensive disaster control measures combined with intangible side of things. So what we need is comprehensive flood control measures in catchment areas. So we are shifting to that kind of measures. So far, we haven't really utilized city planning methodologies and the building code. But utilizing these methods, we should work on the countermeasures against disasters. And also, how can we live safer in terms of housing? And what kind of houses would be safer in disasters? And how can we protect our lives? from the perspective of safer housing. And I may be touching on some difficult concepts here, but there is a tangible preparation, intangible preparations. And how far should we work on that? In terms of tangible improvement, it takes over does it's for a hazard that could happen in several decades or hundred years. As for the scale of a tangible preparation, it if it's not ready then we need to also think about how we can improve intangible uh, preparations. This concept can be utilized for a certain urban areas with certain level of a population. That would be the assumption to combine these tangible and intangible preparations for a disaster which may happen in, ten, in some, ten, uh, some dozens of years or 100 years. We need to work on that tangible preparation and at the same time, we also need to work on intangible countermeasures. 
So these are the concepts that we can think about going forward. Depending on the region and situation, the details may differ. But this is the basic concept that we can take into consideration in terms of countermeasures. And as it's been mentioned earlier, there is a concept of flood control in catchment area. About this concept, I just explained a little bit, but there's a plant flood. And for the plant flood, we work on the improvement of a tangible aspects. And as for the possible maximum flood, we also work on risky communication and implement various measures to protect lives from flood risks. As for this catchment, as for the flood control measures in catchment areas, there is a comprehensive flood control measures. It combines tangible and intangible preparations for disasters. And around 1980s, these comprehensive measures started, but the progress hasn't been smooth. And these are what the comprehensive flood control measures include. It's not a new idea. but we need to proceed with this plan, and that's the flood control catchment area measures. So what's catchment area? So rainwater and the snow goes into the river, and that area is called catchment area. Within this area, we need to do a comprehensive flood control measures. And basis for that has is a regulation which will be in place from this April. And there is a comprehensive flood control measures. And what's different from that in terms of catchment flood control measure is that it's based on the catchment area flood control management, and they do the elevation of foundations for houses. And if some area has high risk, then they relocate people to the lower risk areas. These are in included in the catchment area flood control measures, and the budget will be allocated for that too. So that's the catchment area flood control project. So there are Classe River system, which is 109 watt river system. In that river system, we have this project and it'll be implemented. So this is one example. In Kujigawa River water river system, this is a project for that river system. As I said earlier, there are many initiatives going on depending on the catchment areas, and they are trying to increase the flood control measures. And it's bridging many cities and prefectures, and that's how it will be implemented. So these kinds of projects are proceeding. You may feel that then, that then it's OK. But as these projects move forward, flood, con flood risk will be lowered, and also safer places will increase. However, as for the catchment area flood control measures, it's based on those river systems. So 
there needs there is also a need of regulation on land use and these methodologies methodologies will be implemented in many regions in order to promote this kind of measures so land use restrictions will be required and with the steep planning methodologies with building code we are also able to conduct some disaster mitigation measures. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So these are the examples of what we can do with building code in terms of disaster mitigation. I may be going, may be going into some difficult discussion here, requiring some expertise, but at the prefecture level, for example, in Shiga Prefecture, there's an ordinance like this. Over 50 millimeters rainfall per hour, 170 millimeters per 24 hours rainfall occurs. If that occurs, then for the areas in which we expect inundation of over 50 centimeters, then they are not allowed to do the urbanization in that area. So this is what the Siga prefecture is doing. As for the government level, the city planning regulations revised, and they need to take into consideration the disaster risks in terms of city planning. Before this act was, or regulation was revised, they didn't really need to take into consideration. However, after the revision, although they may not be able to avoid all the risks, but standards and levels have been more clarified with this revision which will be a breakthrough. And also urbanizing control, there are urbanization control areas and there will be, there will be more rigorous regulations about urbanization from the perspective of disaster risks. And there's also a location optimization plan as well. And by promoting and de promoting these urbanization or non-urbanization, there's a master plan. So with this location optimization plan, there are residential promotion areas set up. When they consider or set up the residential promotion area, they need to take into consideration the disaster risks. As for inundation prone areas, with this plan, the standard has, been, has become more strict. As for flood damage inundation risks, this plan and regulation has become more rigorous. I'll be skipping these. So in areas with higher disaster risks, you may think that houses should not be allowed to be built in that areas, but there is a regulation to prohibit that as well. So they have some building regulations in those areas by determining that area to be disaster prone areas, but it's not proceeding too well due to the fact that it could limit the individual's freedom and rights. So there is a difficulty like that. 
by designing some areas to be disaster-prone area. This kind of regulation needs to be preceded not individually but comprehensively in terms of the catchment area, flood control plan, and so on. So there has been some efforts like that. As for the catchment area flood control ordinance, the government is leading that effort. So I introduced Shiga Prefecture's catchment area flood control project. And they are not allowing houses to be built on disaster prone areas. That's what Shiga Prefecture is doing. But the they also need more than regulations to do that. So they are also offering aid for the houses, which will have higher foundation to prevent flood risks and flood disasters. This is some examples for that. For new housings, they provide aid for elevating the foundation. It's not in full amount, but they do provide some aid with limited amount. So by elevating the foundation, it'll be safer. And some people choose to relocate to other areas, while other people want to remain in the same area. For them, they are offering options to elevate the foundation to prevent inundation. And so they are promoting, in a way, a safer housing. So I have talked about what the government and the prefectures are doing. Lastly, I want to talk about what we can do in terms of individuals from the perspective of safer housing. So what can we do about safer housing? There are many measures we can take. In red, I'm describing understanding the flood risk information utilizing hazard maps and also getting information regarding flood risks in term, in, at times of a real estate transaction and also the inundation countermeasures at the house as well. First, no matter what we do, in the area we, where we live, there is a hazard maps. And by looking at the hazard maps, we can understand the disaster risks. That's very important. Recently, we can look at these hazard maps and other hazard information on the internet as well. And the government offers these information, and some prefectures also offer these information regarding disaster risks in details. So by looking at that information, you can look up where you live and understand what kind of risks are there and expected. Secondly, even though we can look at the hazard maps and hazard information, we sometimes forget to check that. So at times of a real estate transaction, flood risks information must be provided by real estate brokers. That's what the Ordinance for Enforcement of a Building Transaction Business Act says. So at times of a real estate transaction, they have to offer information to warn people about these risks. As long as the area is not a disaster-prone area, flood risks was not really provided beforehand. But with the revision of this act, now real estate brokers are mandated to provide that information.
So what can we do to prevent inundation? First, elevating foundations, then still the houses, or we can enclose the houses and or flood proof the building too. So we can elevate the foundation or the ground. And also we can have stilt houses by utilizing penalty structure and so on. So that we don't have to build our houses, build the houses where it is prone to flood. We can elevate the foundation. We can also enclose the houses with flood wall or fences which are flood proof and use the flood wall gate to prevent the inundation. These are what we can do. However, as for the flood proof measures, it's costly. So some people may discuss that or consider that, but they may give up because it's too costly and go ahead with building houses in disaster prone areas. That could happen. So flood proofing is recommended, but it is costly. And with a more technical innovation, it may become more reasonable going forward, but it will require more cost than building houses in a normal way. In the meantime, houses may be inundated. We may allow some houses to be inundated, but we can also think in terms of making recovery, rebuilding easier. For instance, by placing power outlet at the higher positions. These are also what we can do with less cost. Housing manufacturers and construction companies can work on these things. But at the same time, consumers who will be building houses and buying houses can also voice these concerns and ask for these countermeasures to be implemented. And to prevent inundation, we can do these things as well. As I said earlier, in Mapi, Krasiki city, there was five meter inundation. When that happens, it's not really realistic to elevate the foundation by five meters. So you have to evacuate and protect your lives. So horizontal, so vertical evacuation going to the higher ground will be important in case of emergency like this. Thereby, you can protect your life. So it's important not to inundate evacuation space. That would be the important concept. Instead of building costly flood-proof buildings, you can be creative and implement these measures by creating some evacuation space in the second story and so on. So we need to think about the flood control measures based on risks. And we need to think about tangible and intangible things. So it will be important to live in a safer places, but it's not something everyone can do. In Japan, we have many inundation prone areas. Therefore, it's important to build a safer houses or build, housing, build houses which can be recovered more easily. And also think about how you can evacuate safely. In order to do these things, you need to understand hazard risks in your area. Thank you for your attention. 
We would like to take a break for 10 minutes. Thank you for waiting. Now I'd like to begin part two lecture, local communities. First, I'd like to invite Professor Mayumi Sakamoto, Graduate School of Disaster Resilience and Governance, University of Hyogo, to talk about creating sustainable community through community-based disaster management plan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Professor Mayumi Sakamoto from Graduate School of Disaster Resilience and Governance, University of Hyogo. In part one, we look at climate change from different perspectives and different angles. Today, I'd like to talk about activities and effort that we can execute in community based on that climate change input and link it to the disaster risk management. So in Japan, this community-based disaster management plan was put in place. This plan is created by resident through their collaboration. And that plan is proposed to municipal government. And municipal government discuss at disaster management council and reflect that suggestion, the proposal from the resident into municipal disaster management plan. Previously, prefecture had their disaster management plan and municipal government prepared disaster management plan in order to promote disaster preparedness. But this community-based disaster management plan changes the framework drastically. Residents lead the activity making plans suggestions to be included in the government's plans. It's been six years since community-based disaster management plan has been started, and the activity of preparing that plan is ongoing across the nation. And today, I will talk about something that Professor Bamba mentioned earlier. It is about the July 2018 heavy rain event. Mabi town in Kurasiki city was devastated by this heavy rain. And it is a small town with 26,000 population located in Kurasiki city. Because of the July 2018 heavy rain event, 51 uh, people were killed and others uh, devastated by it. And also the rivers had a risk of flooding. So Classic City checked the water level and kept issuing warnings and cautions. Especially the flooding of Oda River was anticipated, so July 6th, at 10 o'clock in the evening, evacuation advisory was issued across the Mabi town, and 11 p.m. evacuation order was issued. So those were actually the evacuation advisory order was to encourage people to evacuate to the designated shelters or evacuation centers which were divided by district of schools. And how they were able to evacuate or did they really evacuated? Actually, Mabi Town, Okada uh, District has been working on reviewing, reflecting what actually happened and what are the lessons they were able to learn from this event. And Takahashi River is running on the eastern side and also, Suemasa, the Suemasa River is running at the side, which is the tributary of the Oda River. And the flooded water inundated this Okada district entire region. And people started to evacuate to the higher ground on the northern part of the district and we looked back how they behaved in the evacuation. And black text shows what they 
took as action, and the review result is mentioned in the red text. First, school gymnasium was the evacuation center. By the plan, the gym was supposed to accommodate 180 people, but actually 2,000 people came to evacuate to the gymnasium at the middle of the night because of the flood. So the Board of Education was managing and actually uh, operating the evacuation center, but actually the gym was closed. So the community uh, council had to contact the Board of Education to open up the key uh, or lock. And actually people had to guide arriving uh, vehicles arriving at the shelter, like this picture. The space was packed by the vehicles at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock or so. And also, people tried to contact the elderly who are not able to evacuate by themselves. And we call those elderly resident in need of assistance in evacuation. And municipalities and communities have the list of such resident and in the case of emergency there are people who contact them and offer assistance in evacuation but uh, actually the list had 180 elderly residents and we have uh, these uh, community case workers and who are the volunteer workers uh, there were six case workers, and they contacted 180 elderlies. Actually, there are some elderlies who refused to evacuate, and there are some elderlies who went to the evacuation center at the early hours, but there was nobody, so they came back to their home. And also, the relief supplies were not stored at the shelter. By the plan, the city officers was supposed to transfer the uh, storage supplies from the city hall to the shelter. But uh, because of the flooding, the supply of food arrived three days after the shelter was opened. So people went for shopping for meals. Also, they prepared meals at the school, but this is the school. They were told not to use the fire or the gas because it's been raining. It wasn't possible for them to prepare meal outside of the, outside, uh, the gymnasium. So they had to use other places, but it was very difficult because the flooding is still remaining. And they have confirmed that it is difficult, even if district leadership has some capability of dealing with it, it is impossible for them to take care of everything by themselves. On top of district leadership, the strength of neighborhood must be utilized. And in this uh, district, seven people were killed by the flood. All those uh, people were the residents in need of assistance in evacuation, and they were not saved or rescued. There were some people who evacuated. For example, this female, 84 years old, she is living alone, and she has some problem in her knee, and she's been always told by people to evacuate in order not to cause trouble to other people. So she remembered that. So when the rain continued, she packed up her stuff and waited for someone to pick her up at the front door and somebody came up and she was able to evacuate with that person. The other example is who refused to evacuate. The district leadership came to this gentleman, told to evacuate, but he refused. And also the uh, neighborhood association head came over and persuaded, but he refused. And his son came over and told, but he refused. Actually, he evacuated in place on the second floor, 
he was saved. Actually, he was missing for a while. He was rescued by boat. And he was taken to a temple nearby and carried over to another shelter. And his、uh, truck was lost and he was missing for a while, but he survived. So the awareness of people in the community and also the assistance from neighbors is very important. But There are people who are not able to evacuate on their own, so we need to have, to,、uh, we need to have the system put in place to assist them. And in May last year, the Basic Act on Disaster Management was revised, and an evacuation plan for individual people or personal evacuation plan was enacted. This is to assist such people in evacuation. Looking back this event, community caseworkers and community disaster management organization members supported people who, with full export, but it was difficult for them to do everything by themselves. So we need to have somebody who can assist in evacuation, like family members, neighbors, next door. So, we have to put in place networking in, before a disaster h i t In Mabi Okada district, they had been talking about the disaster event and also the operation of shelter, how they were able to recover, and how community helped recover people. So, they have put together that information in those brochures. For example, the largest number of people evacuated at 11 o'clock when the evacuation order was issued or advisory was issued. But previously, we had three、uh, levels of evacuation that is, evacuation caution, evacuation. Advisory and evacuation order. And evacuation advisory was abolished after the revision. So, when is the best timing for you to evacuate? It's a very important question. And also, when the shelter was opened up, this is the picture taken immediately after the opening of the shelter. This is a public space like a、uh, gymnasium or schools are often used for the shelter. The reason is because it is often located in a safer place and easy access. And also, it can accommodate a lot of people. And school has higher earthquake proof quality. Therefore, Uh, it, they are often designated as the shelter, but the gymnasium is not an easy place for people to live. Actually, the city officials take care of opening up, setting up the shelter. And when、uh, the shelter is opened up, they don't operate the shelter. They just came over to open the lock of the gymnasium and they opened the reception. But the number of evacuees increased dramatically, so they had to suspend the reception. And it was supposed to accommodate 180 people, but 2,000 people came. So there are some people who had to sleep on corridors. They never imagined that situation. And also, the emergency supplies were kept by the city. However, they were not stored at the gymnasium. And the first food brought in was from volunteers. And there was no designated person who、uh, made the list of evacuees. Finally, school teachers made it. So, in the immediate、uh, the after the、uh, disaster, it is a period of confusion and patience. And after a while, 
Lunch books were distributed, but people had to join a line waiting for one hour. It was in the burning sun in summer, and the food was always the same. They had a breakfast. The p e t e of is a melon bread or a k u r k u r bread, and they are sick of looking at melon pan bread. And this is actually、uh, well, another you know, the things that we have to consider. And also,、uh, the shelter operation improved because there was some support from organizations who had that experience. And shelter is operated by citizens. But the citizens are busy with cleaning up all day long and came back to shelter, but they are sick of cleaning up. So it was difficult for people to ask support for cleaning at the shelter. This is the picture taken、uh, at the end of the shelter、uh, period, but it is the very last period. It didn't take place immediately after the opening the shelter. And currently, people are working on developing a community based disaster management plan. When they need to evacuate and they are developing district timeline, so when I should evacuate, that is called my timeline. On the other hand, when rain continues, how to Evacuate residents, that is a district timeline. So, when rain continues, first we have people in charge of collecting the information on rainfall and water level and give information to the district leader for evacuation decisions and collect evacuation information. And the person in charge of starting calling out, contacting neighbors, and also we Uh, have a person in charge of operating shelters. And actually, hands on experience is very important on top of making plans. And、uh, disaster trace was conducted on November 28th. Actually, there is no intervention by the government. This drill was led by residents. So when they re- receive, Information from the person in charge of information sharing, they start to evacuate to the shelter at the school gymnasium. It would be raining, there would be hazards on the road. So they actually are cautious about the COVID, so they check the、uh, health condition and the temperature. And Also, they have the reception by groups. After they split into their community district levels, they do the review of what they have done in this drill. So, there are things that have to be taken care of by the district and individual people when it comes to disaster response. So, where you should、uh, evacuate and How you are able to communicate that, and you need to keep supplies of the response or the emergency at home as well. And you should know who are living in your community, also about elderly and foreigners, and also residents in need of assistance evacuation. The community is responsible for understanding that information. Also, In order to ensure everyone would evacuate safely, we need to educate people and improve the road for evacuation and prepare the residents in need of assistance evacuation to be evacuated smoothly. And these are the things not done by the municipal government but by the residents in the community. And community can do. Something before a disaster o c c u r and after a disaster hit, your responsibility also increases as well. Who evacuated to where? And also, Dr. Tabata said earlier about the disaster waste, how we are able to dispose of the disaster waste. 
So these things are something that be taken care with the initiatives of residents. So these kind of activities are ongoing across the nation. I hope these activities will help all the municipalities and communities around the Japan uh, will increase the, res uh, the resilience. Thank you very much for your attention. Next lecture is by Dr. Dural Fototan, senior researcher from Asian Disaster Reduction Center. The topic is Disaster Resilient Community Case Study in the Philippines. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon and maybe good day to everyone participating via Zoom. So this afternoon, let me share um, some thoughts, some ideas about resilient community uh, in the Philippines. So it was December 2013, we went to a province and visited several communities that were impacted by uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan. It was one of the strongest typhoon that Im impacted the Philippines for several years of uh, record of typhoon. So it was one of the biggest. So we were there uh, as a team from the Asian Disaster Reduction Center, and we also had some friends from JICA and other organizations here in Japan. So what we did there was that uh, we visited a community, look at the impact of um, the disaster in the area, and we talked to some of uh, the people that were impacted. And we asked about uh, their preparedness, the response, and also how they recover from uh, the impact of those disaster. And this is uh, some of the photos that I took, and um, we noticed that the impact was really huge. And in the communities that we visited, most of the houses were flattened. Uh, the roof were not there. And um, we observed that uh, the condition before the disaster was already weak. And that's why when the disaster, uh, when typhoon came and impacted the area, so it's easily banished because uh, they already had uh, vulnerable houses over there. And the situation of the people in the area was that um, many of the people were, they uh, wage earners. So they earn only for the day, like for example, driving this, uh, they call it a tricycle in the local language. It's a three-wheel bicycle wherein you can, uh, uh, somebody will uh, take a ride and pay you some money and then they earn that for the day. And some were fishermen and farmers and they were exposed to uh, the sea because they were living very near to the coastal area. So that was uh, uh, the situation. So wait, when uh, Super Typhoon hit them, uh, the impact was huge. So there was already pre-existing vulnerabilities in the area that made the impact even uh, worse. So how, how they prepare, how people responded, and how they recover from those disasters. One of the observations we found in every community is that there was this Sari Sari store. This is a local uh, language. Sari Sari store is a small kind of business wherein you have some small uh, uh, food stuff, like uh, instant noodles, cooking oils, eggs, things like that. And during this time, this is very useful because uh, even the government, they prepared for the relief goods, but they place it near the coastal areas and there was this uh, typhoon surge. So all those reliefs were uh, taken away or they were sweeped away by, by the storm surge. So there were no uh, instant relief from the government. So, but the Sari Sari store immediately uh, put up by 
uh, the residents so other people can uh, buy some of the instant noodles, eggs, and things like that so that they can recover. So this is a practical capacity for them as a relief. Uh, so they have like, uh, even before the disaster, these are existing Sari Sari store, every community, almost every blacks uh, of, of, of the Philippines. So it's like a practical capacity for, for relief, uh, for like a stockpile, if you want to call it that way, that uh, when the disaster happened, they have something uh, uh, as a source of their uh, immediate uh, food. So that's one. Then during um, uh, uh, the impact, then one of the things that they can uh, respond as, their, as one of their practical capacity is they can rescue uh, uh, their neighbors, their very close friends. And so it's not the government that rescue immediately some of those uh, people that were impacted, but it's their neighbors, it's their friends uh, from, uh, from the community. And why does this happen? Because even before that, they have this practical capacity, they have the pra practical practices, um, wherein they have, in Philippines, almost communi every community has got fiestas, wherein we celebrate certain event where everyone can just come in and share foods, you can find, <laughs> they call it bottle fight, wherein foods are just served everywhere and then you can uh, eat together. And during fiestas, there are teamwork wherein one community will uh, compete in terms of uh, basketballs or other games uh, with one another. And they share this kind of uh, events. So they come very close to one another even before the disaster. So when the disaster happened, they uh, uh, rescue one another. So that's a uh, practical capacity for rescue. And another observation we found is that I took this one year, uh, it's in Tacloban City, we're in just three weeks before, uh, after the disaster, then people are starting to uh, put up uh, their small houses. And everyone just helped for free because uh, there is this uh, practical capacity for recovery we're in. Even before the disaster, every member of uh, the community are helping uh, each other, like for moving houses, for uh, sharing their uh, utensils, everyone, for free because they are part of the community. So we call that uh, in the Philippines as Bayanian. So it's also a, a practical capacity for recovery. So there is some context there that uh, there are some cultural practices that help them to prepare, to uh, recover, as well as uh, respond to the disaster. But the question now when we talk about resilient community is, uh, does it happen always? Of course, that's the question. And we asked them and they said no. Uh, sometimes it's just very spontaneous. Sometimes uh, you need someone that would uh, 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 initiate it. And so it's not happening all the time. So although there are these practical capacities, but it doesn't happen all the time. So that's the question now is, uh, is it really resilient or is it just spontaneous in time? Although there is, there is this kind of practical capacity. So we look at uh, some of the official recovery records and activities from the government. And the focus is more on, on uh, these things like uh, infrastructure, services, resettlement. So the investment are all this uh, uh, more on these uh, physical capacities and projects, but we cannot find some investment in the community. We cannot find investment in terms of uh, community uh, resiliency. And this uh, keep us asking, what if, what if we invest in communities' practical capacities? And in fact, uh, when we look at other cases, uh, we found that there are some local governments in the Philippines that are investing in the community practical capacities. And one of these is uh, in, in uh, San Francisco, Cebu province. This is very nearby uh, province of Lake Tewa where we visited. 
And it was also impacted by uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan. <coughs> but here, the mayor invested in the community activities where he called it as a Purok uh, system. So Purok system is a community organizing approach wherein um, 50 to 100 households were organized and uh, they elect some officers and then it complements, they have some activities that I will discuss later that would complement the lowest uh, uh, barangay level of, uh, it's a local government level of, uh, in, in the Philippines. So I just show you some of the structures. So we have uh, three layers of uh, government. So we have the national government, then we have the province, and under that we have municipalities. And then after that we have the uh, barangays. These are the official, and uh, barangay is the, it's the village level uh, form of government official. They have budget, uh, and they have some officials there that were elected. So, and below that, there are households, and these are not part of the government, but they can be organized. And uh, the way it was organized is that um, uh, in 50 to 100 households, it can be part of the barangay of the official uh, uh, government, but they act as a complementary organization. They are people's organization. They don't have any salary. They don't have any uh, uh, benefits from the local government, but the official that was elected at the local level will be representing them, will be part of them in that uh, Puruk system. So they were organized. And what were their activities? So uh, the traditional activities of the Puruk is that uh, they have this uh, community cleaning and this is a competition that they can earn some money if they win beautification, and they organize fiestas, the one that I told you. When fiestas, these are group events where you have some uh, games, you have uh, uh, festivals, you have some magic shows and things like that. And people are very eager to participate in this and because there are also free, uh, uh, many frees, uh, like you can eat anywhere even if you don't know uh, that people. And so uh, what the local government did is that on top of these traditional activities of the Purok, uh, these are the 50 to 100 households that have these leaders, they also organize uh, DRR activities, like for example, uh, uh, drills and uh, community-based early warning. These are, for example, uh, in floods, they will know some of uh, simple uh, warning systems uh, for floods. And they also are uh, started to draw by themselves hazard maps. And these are the communities that, you know, they, it's like uh, uh, town watching where they go around the community, watch where are those hazards, and then reflect it in the hazard map. So they know where are the risks and how to evacuate when disaster happened. So those are the activities that were integrated into the Purok. So, uh, and it pays. So it is well documented. There are many documents here already and uh, official reports and uh, research that they had zero casualty during that time. While the neighboring uh, provinces like Tacloba, uh, cities like Tacloban and provinces like Leyte were hugely uh, devastated because of, of uh, Super Typhoon Ayan. But here, in uh, San Francisco, Cebu, they have zero casualties. And why was that? Because through the Purok system, they have this um, early warning system, and they also uh, had a preemptive uh, evacuation. So when they learned that uh, uh, it's a big typhoon, so they already warned the community, and they uh, preemptively evacuated people uh, that are on the track of the typhoon. So what are the insights uh, from uh, organizing the community, uh, particularly maybe through the Puruk system? One is that um, in, it enhances the, the practical capacities for disaster response and recovery. So it's not just spontaneous this time, 
but it become more uh, institutionalized, it become more organized because they make it as part of their uh, lifestyle. And it also institutionalizes uh, mutual help, uh, the Bayanian system. So it's being institutionalized uh, because they have now leaders, they have regular activities, and they can have some funds uh, from the local government if they, through uh, projects, that they partner with the local government. And it also prepares the community how to evacuate. Remember, they can make now the hazard maps, they know where to go and what are the uh, risks in the area. And they also officially could help each other in rescue and response. And also uh, they can cope up with uh, the disaster. And uh, like for example, the Sari Sari store I've mentioned, during recovery time, there were more investment now in the Sari Sari store. There were investment now in, uh, in uh, uh, people that doing these hazard maps. So there were now started to invest in the community instead of uh, investing purely on the physical uh, infrastructures. So I think those are just some of the experiences uh, in the Philippines. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Nafisa Ismail, Program Officer, APN Secretariat, Disaster Resilient Community, case study in Band Aceh, Indonesia. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Nafisa from uh, Asia Pacific Network for Global Change, APN. And today I'm sharing some of my work during my PhD a few years back on a disaster risk Disaster Resilient Community Case Study of Bandaje. So before I move on, please allow me to introduce myself just a little bit. I came to Japan for the first time um, in 2009 as an exchange student at uh, Tokyo. And I went back to Malaysia in 2011 uh, to finish my bachelor degree. And I came back again to Japan in 2012, and I have been in Japan since then. So. Before moving to Kobe, I uh, studied at Kyoto University uh, for my PhD. And during my free times, I like to go cycling as far as Akashi City or the northern part of Kobe. <laughs> OK, so for today's presentation, I will um, introduce and provide you with some uh, background of the case study that I did uh, during my PhD years in Indonesia and how I look at disaster resilient uh, communities using the livelihood approach and the acquired resources that uh, makes household resilient towards uh, disaster. So moving on, I am sure that some of you might wondering um, how I get interested about disaster coming from a country, Malaysia, which have not much natural disasters such as earthquakes, tsunami, or typhoon, etc. So how I met with disaster risk reduction, the first um, experience was during the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, which occurred during my senior high school years. So the northwest part of Malaysia was impacted, 8,000 were displaced, 6 missing, and 68 deaths. So for a country that never experienced earthquake or tsunami before, this is a big number for us. And also the damage that it brought to the economy and social sector, particularly on people's livelihood and also their mental health. And the second one, as you recall, I was an exchange student in Tokyo, and I came back to Malaysia actually in January 2011. And two months after that, the Great Tohoku earthquake happened. And that got me triggered of what happened to me if I was still in Japan. And that also triggered for me to know more about disaster and to understand the impact disaster could bring in my life, other people's life, and also how people can um, stand up and recover from the disaster. So let's get into more details. So this is where uh, my study took place in Indonesia. And on the top right image is the Aceh province, where on the very, very tip of this area, you could see it's uh, Banda Aceh, which is the capital city of Aceh province. So Aceh, Banda Aceh is about 61.3 36 kilometers square, 
and it is about the size of the combination of Nadaku and Higashi Nadaku with a population of about 252,899. So those who are familiar with Kobe, it's about the population of Nishiku in Kobe city. So the weather in Banda Aceh is tropical rainforest with the economy before disaster was mainly oil and gas mining, agriculture and services. But at the moment, it's more on manufacturing, tourism, agriculture, oil and gas. So the local transportation over there is mostly rickshaw, buses and taxis. So in this image, um, it is the damage that occurred uh, in the Aceh province. So the dark shaded area, uh, the most affected area, which includes Banda Aceh city. And on the, your right, it's a table that shows the damage and losses of Aceh province after the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. So if you see 78% of the private sector were destructed and this private sector comprises of homes, productive lands, fishing boats, aquaculture land, small medium enterprises, and this whole um, damages is estimated about taking up 97% uh, of Aceh's GDP. So moving on, let me walk you through to the place where I um, conducted my studies. So I went to two villages. So in village one, you can see um, there's the entrance and um, the housing layout is so much better right now. So these pictures are taken when I was there in 2016 or 17 like that. And then um, a, build, a newly escaped Jaika build building um, of 30 meters in that village. So in the second village, so if you can see from here, both villages are located in the tsunami inundated areas, village one being about five kilometers towards the shore and village two being very, very close, less than one kilometer to the shore. So this is the picture of village two, the entrance to the village, um, some aquaculture ponds, as well as uh, the current layout of the housing. So moving on, um, I want to share with you the satellite image that I managed to get from um, the local government there. So there are some differences. So if you look at November 2004, which is the pre-disaster area, um, the housing area, I mean, the housing layout is quite messy over there. Housing are scattered. You cannot even see the road. And there are a little bit here and there of aquaculture pond. And then if you look at the post-disaster um, image on January 2015, 10 years, about 10 years after disaster, um, the, lay the layout of the village is more organized right now with proper roads, proper wider roads. And it's also concentrated around the Jaika built um, 30 meter escape building with moss, um, public health, community halls, and some little shops there. So this is the picture taken post-disaster, shared by the villagers. And on your left, top left, is an image taken immediately after the disaster. And the, and the picture in the middle is taken right after a few years after the disaster. As tsunami swept away um, the houses, house owners had trouble to find out where their house were, and therefore land plotting for house reconstructions was necessary then. And during, while waiting for the housing to be reconstructed, um, some temporary house was constructed as well. And at the same time, you can see there's also flooding disaster there then. And on the bottom picture is a picture of some of the aquaculture ponds being transformed into fish pond with the help of international organization. So for the second village, if you could see um, pre-disaster situation, June 2004, it's mainly made up of aquaculture ponds. Almost three quarter of the village is, con uh, is mostly comprises of aquaculture pond. And similar to the village number one, the housing layout is also quite messy and scattered everywhere. And immediately after, a year after the disaster, January 2005, you can see most of the aquaculture ponds are totally destroyed and unusable. And at present state, none of the aquaculture 
uh, ponds are usable, except for a very few, very few which uh, has successfully uh, underwent rehabilitation processes. And also, in the new, I mean, in the current present time, housing areas are properly arranged. Houses are orderly, organized with wider escape routes. So in this picture, uh, you can see the non-functional aquaculture ponds in 2007 where um, the government and the uh, external aid organization tried to help uh, the people to restore these uh, ponds. However, not all of the ponds were successful due to some um, soil, uh, water salt intrusion or uh, some other sediments as well as the quality of uh, the water was different too. And on your right hand side, if you could see the blue lines, uh, ponds in blue lines, those are the usable ponds where restoration and rehabilitation was a success and therefore some of the um, people will uh, manage to go back to their pro previous profession which is aquaculture fishers or fishermen. And what is interesting is due to the tsunami, um, some of the ancient tombs were also found in those aquaculture ponds, which dated back uh, around 16th or 17th century. So how resilient is looked at in this case? So first of all, what is livelihood? So livelihood is a type of activity, asset, and the joint access by the individual or the family members in the house to make a living which is uh, defined by the UK department in 1998. But um, it's not limited to a household doing only one activity to meet their needs, but it's multifaceted, contextual, various and dynamic strategies. So in short, livelihood helps to look at the opportunities and constraints of people. It is one of the main uh, components to create resilience within a household or community. So livelihood in disaster recoveries is the restoration and improvement of facilities, livelihoods and living conditions of disaster affected communities, which includes the effort to reduce disaster risk factors. And recovery does not have any standard ending period. It can be seen on the similarities of the recovered conditions um, they demonstrate. And there are challenges though with disaster livelihood in recovery. It is the last, the longest and the most expensive phase, as well as the least understood disaster part of um, the, in the disaster management cycle. <laughs> All right, um, don't, don't be nervous looking at this image. It's just a figure um, to let you know that um, under the livelihood Pentagon, there are five resources that we are going to look at, which is the human, the physical, the financial, the social, and the natural resources. So let's look at uh, the natural cap resources that um, both villages had. So as you have known, due to the location of these villages nearby to the seashore, um, both of them have aquaculture pond as well as um, some mangrove forests. All right, so aquaculture ponds were destroyed um, after the disaster, and the total ponds of those two villages were equivalent to about 160 hectare, 67 hectare, which is about 46 Koshi and baseball stadium. But after the disaster, it has greatly reduced to only 15 functioning um, hectares, which is about only three Koshi and stadium. And some of the functional um, ponds are aquaculture, and as well as some are also uh, being used as fish ponds right now. And as I've mentioned, um, being located near to the shore, um, one of the villages have mangrove forest, which was also destroyed and now has been replanted. This is to provide uh, some protection from the strong winds, future tsunami, as well as providing food for the local community there. And how the government and the international NGOs helped this community is through the restoration of the aquaculture ponds um, to help transform aquaculture ponds into fish ponds, as well as um, teach the local people how to do um, how to cultivate oyster, as well as helping them in the mangrove replantation. So at the moment, the mangrove forest is still small and young, and therefore they could not provide um, a lot of protections from strong winds, especially, and um, still 
minimal in providing food and raw materials for the locals to use. So moving on to the human capital, um, before the 2004, most of the villages are aquacult were aquaculture farmers or fishermen, and some of them um, produce nipa cigarette a producer, if you could see the picture that looks like a traditional cigarettes made from local traditional leaves. And some of them were also making traditional cake and entrepreneur or also working with uh, private companies. And immediately after the disaster, most of them had to rely on international external aid. They work and they get paid by day and receiving food aid. While some of them went fishing, they borrowed the boats and they shared the equipment. Or some of them even went to the seabed to look for seafood. Some offered casual labor, and others went around picking up disaster scrap and selling them. However, after almost more than a decade, everybody started to move on to a more stable, more secure uh, profession. They are entrepreneurs. They are now civil service working with the government. They provided. Uh, they work as a laborer or provide uh, working in a private company. So in this case, the the government and the international uh, NGOs helped them in form of giving providing the people trainings and skills development as well as um, help in the local resource enhancement. So for financial capital, the total monthly income uh, improved. Uh, after disaster, it used to be about $75 per month, but after disaster, uh, at the moment, it's about 111 per month. And this is to support, uh, I mean, to support their financial expenses. Villages also relied on um, savings, uh, women's credit group, external credit service, livestock, as well as the most practical option, which is the informal credit called Arisan or Jilo Jilo. So how does this informal credit Arisa no Jilo Jilo work? It's a group of people who agreed to make regular contribution to a fund, which is then um, given to each of the member in rotation. So Arisa, they play an amount of $200 or $500, while Jilo Jilo, they go in a smaller version of money, which is about $50 or $80, like that. And then moving on, oh, all right. So how the government helped them in financial matters is through microcredits, loan cooperative, livestock program, as well as um, giving or renting high-tech boat for deep sea fishing for those who were previously fishermen. Moving on to the next capital, which is um, the physical capital. So af immediately after the disaster, all homes were destroyed, and the remaining residents lived either at the temporary shelter or evacuation center within the village vicinities, or some evacuation center which is as far as 30 kilometers away from their village. And by 2017, most of the residents received a house from the international organizations such as ADB or World Bank, and they also have the financial, me the financial means to renovate and make uh, more extensions to the original layout. So how um, government and international organizations organization intervene in um, physical capital is through helping uh, the people on land rights and giving them housing support as well as um, having environment and di disaster risk reduction development plan um, during uh, the reconstruction period of uh, the houses. For social capital, um, uh, the existing social capital among the individuals and communities, um, which is also a key factor of uh, contributing to post-disaster recovery, well, I can see that um, th there's a close-knit relationship between the village aid and the villages uh, throughout the disaster recovery period and also up until now. Um, another point 
important point is also the practice of uh, gotong royong, which is the mutual assistance among the villages, which is still valid up until now. So gotong royong concept is an obligation of individual towards society, which can develop uh, meaningful, long-lasting friendships between the members of the community and build trust, which I believe, you know, this kind of gotong royong concept is generally available worldwide, like in the Philippines, Bahinian, or even in Japan, you have the mutual concept too. It's just being labeled with a different name. So before I finish, in short, households in the area that I've uh, visited has changed their livelihood drastically um, to cope with the current lives. So those who used to rely on the natural resources, those fishermen or so those aquaculture fishermen, are now, um, with the help and the intervention of the government and also the external aid, they opted for a more stable and more secure livelihood activities, recovering slowly, but they are recovering gradually from the disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next lecture is by Ms. Chieko Kajisawa, Director of a Program, Div Program Division 1, Jaike Kansai Disaster, Re and Disaster Reduction Learning Center. The topic is Human Resource Development to Support Community-Based Disaster Risk Reduction in Developing Countries. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chieko Kajisawa, Director of a Program Division 1, Jaike Kansai and Disaster Reduction Learning Center. Today, I'd like to talk about the human resource development to support community-based disaster risk reduction in developing countries. In the second part of today's forum, the focus is on how we are implementing community disaster management and Japanese case studies was introduced by Professor Sakamoto and the Philippines case study was introduced by Dr. Perdutan, and the Indonesian case study was also was introduced by Dr. Ismail. So these were these are good practices, and the good practices in the world exist. So I'd like to introduce some good examples from JICA. And we are also introducing these best practices through our training courses as well. That will be the focus of my presentation today. Before I jump into the main point, let me explain what JICA is. It's an independent administrative agency, and it's a Japan International Cooperation Agency which is the implementing agency of ODA. We offer technical cooperation, loan aid, and grant aid, which Japan does for developing countries. We have about 90 bases in the world, while we have 15 bases in Japan. We have staff in Japan and abroad. Jaika Kansai is one of the 15 locations in Japan. We are in charge of Kansai region, and we offer projects. We conduct con projects. So let me explain more about Jaika. Jaika does many kinds of cooperation projects, for example, technical cooperation projects, and also Dr. Ismail talked about the 30 miles buildings. We also offer assistance in terms of aid for that kind of a project as well. With the volcano in Tonga, volcano disaster in Tonga, we're also offering some emergency aid as well. We also dispatch volunteers we also promote private sectors in other countries. We also offer assistance for universities in terms of international communications. 
In the middle of the slide, the red square shows the acceptance of trainees. We accept trainees and conduct training courses in order to share what we have learned in Japan. So we have these kinds of various schemes, and by combining them, we try to offer solutions for development issues in developing countries through discussion with them. So that's what JICA does. And where I belong to, we mainly do the acceptance of trainees. That's what the division where I belong does mainly. Especially in JICA Kansai, we have past experience and knowledge from the great Hanshin earthquake. And we communicate this information and share this information with these trainees from developing countries. In 2007, JICA and Hyogo Prefectural Government jointly set up DRLC, Disaster Reduction Learning Center. JICA's mission is to develop human resources in terms of disaster reduction in developing countries, while Hyogo Prefectural Government wants to share the experiences and lessons learned from the great Hanshin earthquake because Hyogo has received, received many aids and support from all over the world when that earthquake hit. And this is the organization of DRLC. DLLC is set up in JICA Kansai. And we offer human resources and the financial resources. And we also offer the training courses. As you can see at the bottom of the, of the slide, when we do the training, we work with Disaster Reduction and Human Renovation Institution, universities in the prefecture, and Hyogo Institute for Traumatic Stress. So we get these supports in order to conduct our training courses. And what kind of a training courses does the DLSC offer? Since the foundation, over 3,100 trainees have joined the, this training course. Jake Kansai offers about 24 to 25 courses, and half of them is done at DRLC. Before the COVID pandemic, about 200 trainees visited Japan and actually visited some places in Hyogo. However, due to the pandemic, pandemic, they have not been able to come to Japan, but we still offer online courses. In FY 2021, over 100 people are going to be trained in the end. These are what we offer in training courses, especially the lessons we learned from Great Hanshin Earthquake is a focal point for the second course, which is strategies for building disaster resilient societies, and fourth course, disaster management on infrastructure, and six, community-based disaster reduction, and nine, comprehensive disaster management in Latin American countries, and also 12, plan for mental health care in a disaster. These training courses have a focus on lessons learned from the experience of the great Hanshin earthquake. 
This slide shows when trainees actually visited Japan. So inside the Disaster Response Center in Hyogo Prefecture Government, we had a lecture and we also had an assistance from other organizations and we listened to their presentations on various topics. So the second part of this forum is community disaster reduction activities. I want to show you two examples of what JICA Kansai and DRLCs are doing. First of all, this is the training course we offer for officials from the local government in each con in countries, from the countries. So NGO members and other members participate in this course. The overview of a training course is as written here. Through activities of Kobe City's Voluntary Disaster Reduction Organization, we have this disaster prevention welfare community. And participants learn how to enhance community's disaster management capability as the community is at the front line to deal with the disaster. Since 2007, we have been conducting this course with the help of Kobe Municipal Fire Department. We have been offering this course. And there are self-help, mutual help, and public help in terms of disaster reduction in the community, and this course focuses on public health help. About 80% of the people, affected people who suffered the disaster were helped by the person in the community. And these examples are also introduced in this course. And these officers go back to their country after participating in this course. And what they do in their own countries are shown on this slide. So this is San Jose in, in Philippines. Based on what they learned from Hyogo in Hyogo, they set up the school safety committee jointly managed by local citizens, school staff, and municipalities. And in the bottom of the slide, this is another case study. There is disaster reduction training event originated in Kansai region called Iza Kairu Caravan. And these trainees learned that in Hyogo and go back to their own countries and localize that event and offer disaster reduction education or training in their own country, utilizing what they learned. Another example is about foreign residents in Japan. 27 years have passed since the great Hanshin earthquake and 11 years have passed since the great northern Japan earthquake. And Japan has some issues such as aging population and less people joining the disaster reduction activities. Despite that, there are also more disasters related to climate change and the quality and the level of disasters have changed in recent years and some foreign residents may not understand what they can do when they experience disasters. That's why JICA Kansai decided to do these activities. There are increasing number of Vietnamese residents in Kansai. And since 2020, we are doing these activities for Vietnamese groups. This slide shows the kick-off event in December 2020. So 
So Vietnamese residents did these kind, participated in these activities. We share the information regarding what we do in terms of disaster reduction in Japan with Vietnamese residents. And we also had a discussion. In the discussion, some opinions were raised, such as why not provide some disaster reduction activity for technical intern trainees who may not understand Japan well, Japanese well. Due to the pandemic, these activities are not progressing as we planned, but we want to further strengthen these activities going forward. So these are what we are doing in terms of human resource developing, development in developing countries. Lastly, what we want to communicate in these disaster risk reduction trainees is that, as I said in the beginning, we have many disaster experiences in Japan and abroad, and we want to share that information. There is a concept of a build back better. It means we want to recover better. We, with recovery, we want to build something better. This is a key word in the world in terms of disaster reduction. After the Great Hanshin earthquake, the former governor in that region also suggested this concept too. Japan has learned lessons every time we face disasters, and we want to communicate that to the world. Another thing is that disaster reduction is something we need to tackle globally. There are international frameworks regarding disaster reduction in 2005. UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction was held and the Hilgo Framework for Action was adapted. This is the common framework globally. The other international framework, with the target of 2030, there are SDGs. Disaster reduction is relevant to all the goals, in my opinion. In Sendai framework and SDGs, there is a concept of leaving no one behind which I believe is the principle of SDGs. In the disaster reduction, that concept, leaving no one behind, is crucial. And also in developing countries, inequality is also crucial in order not to leave anyone behind. And Citizens in Hyogo are, in a way, top runners, front runners of the disasters as well. And Jaika Kansai want to contribute to this education and training too. Thank you. Now we end the lecture part. Now we'd like to move on to the Q&A session. We'd like to read your questions, and we will appoint who will answer to that question. So this is a question to uh, Mr. Wenisi. Due to the impact from climate change, you mentioned that the yield crop, crop yield of, has been decreasing and the quality has been decreasing. Are there anything that you are doing in terms of these issues? Thank you for your question. In the presentation, I briefly explained that in order to improve the qualities of Yamada Nishiki, we set up some system and also 
we are doing other activities for shifting to other brand of rice as well. We are also working on development of heat-resistant species or varieties. We are also working on cultivation method for strawberries and so on. More specifically, in Tamba region, and there is a decreased yield crop and quality We are working on more effective way to combat bugs and watering, and also working on watering using drones and so on in terms of watering. And we are also trying to do the. P we are also doing the POC for appropriate watering system too, which can lead to improved quality. So that's what we are actually doing. Thank you very much. We still have some time, so we'd like to continue with Q&A. The Secretariat will lead out questions from the audience, and the lecturer will answer the question. This question is for Professor Bamba. Catchment area flood control is important in terms of adaptation measure, and what about the human resource development and the current status analysis to manage the forests and Satoyama Mountains? Thank you for your question. As I talked about the catchment area flood code control, I also talked about the city planning and so on. The management of a forest require water retention and the countermeasures against the landslide. Unfortunately, I haven't, I am not able to answer the question regarding the current analysis of human resource development in terms of management of forest. I believe Ms. Uenishi or Dr. Tsukada is more familiar with this. So could you assist me in answering this question? So I'm Wenishi from Hyogo Prefecture Government. Regarding human resource development, it's an important issue. Hyogo Prefecture Government regards that as an important issue. We all offer seminars to for to develop human resources on renewable energy. We have done that last year, and we are going to do that going forward as well. But as for your question, how we are developing human resources to manage forest in terms of catchment area flood control, we'd like to tackle this issue as the Hyogo Prefecture government moving forward. We have another question. Dr. Jara Pututan, uh, it's from uh, Mr. Kamal from Nepal. How is the inclusion of traditional and indigenous, indigenous, indigenous knowledge, practices, and innovation in the adaptation process? Okay, Mr. Kamal, thank you so much for uh, the question. Perhaps in answering this question, uh, uh, the Philippine experience might give some insights on uh, what has been done. For example, in the Philippines, uh, I think I've shown earlier, during the recovery process, there is this um, perspective, is a strategic perspective that somehow excluded some of the traditional practices. Like for example, we look at uh, the investment for recovery the investment are more on infrastructure, more on uh, physical uh, recovery. And there was no uh, investment in the community. So 
how to uh, uh, include these traditional practices and how to include community practices is to change this kind of perspective at looking at the community mainly as a recipient of aid. So they are not just a recipient of aid, but they are part of the process. So this is a strategic approach uh, that might be uh, uh, reconsidered. So that's one. And the second uh, 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 insight in the Philippine case is the importance of community building or community organizing. We have to organize the community because they have some practical capacities. They have adaptation capacities that uh, might be spontaneous, but if you organize them, it become part of their, uh, uh, it become institutionalized. It become uh, more organized. So in this way, uh, we need to organize the community, like for example, in uh, making hazard maps, in having drills, and uh, they, by this process, they can integrate uh, what are the practices, what are the traditional practices into a more institutionalized approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those three speakers uh, answering to those questions. And we'd like to uh, end the part two. Lastly, I'd like to invite uh, Professor, uh, Professor or, uh, Bamba, Michiko Bamba, uh, Graduate School of Disaster Resilience Governance, University of Hyogo, to deliver a few words to conclude the session. Thank you very much for joining us today. We have a lot of people joining us online as audience. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much for your questions too. It was a good discussion. Yes, uh, we have some homework from the questions and we will look into them and we will reflect them in our studies and researches. It was a short time, but we were able to cover a lot of topics, but they are still some part of the entire picture. So climate change and the impact on global situation is imminent. And also the increase in intensity and the severity of the uh, weather event is actually occurring. And we may be exposed to risks that we have never experienced in the past. You may feel concerned but we have to take action in order to avoid possible risks. And so the national government, prefecture, municipalities, schools, communities, and citizens, we have to be united in making concerted efforts. In our effort will help us to overcome those risks. And when activities are implemented separately, it will not be effective and efficient, but we have to increase effectiveness and efficiency by uniting our efforts. And that is what I learned from this today's forum. And we should expand our attention beyond disaster risk reduction because they are also linked to other part of the problems in the society like poverty. So those problems are the global problems, and it's a problem for each individual of us. And we have to have a global perspective when we look into those problems. It is a responsibility for each individual of us, and uh, we should be able to act on something. And what something, what we can do? As we learned from the speakers today, I think uh, we, you are able to find some hints or the, some ideas. So in the first part, we learned 
thinks about urban development in consideration of sustainable recovery effort by the prefecture, national government, and municipality, and also reduction of possible disaster waste and resilient land use and housing. And in the second part, we learned about local communities by utilizing the example from the Philippines and Indonesia, and we learned the importance of the neighborhood strengths and resilience that is established to put in place in community before a disaster. So it is something about us, what actually going on around us has to be understood and we have to take actions for climate change with, through mitigation and adaptation. And each individual's effort is important. And I hope this forum will help you to start your activities soon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. With this, we'd like to conclude today's forum. Thank you very much for joining us for many hours. Please scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in your chat box for questionnaire. Please uh, use the questionnaire form for asking questions about the lecture. We'd like to stop broadcasting now. Thank you very much for your participation.